Good evening, our dear friend John, and good, good morning, uh, the European colleagues. So we are connecting today very close people for, at a very uh, huge distance. And I really have the privilege to welcome you, John, here in Belgrade, at least virtually today, and to talk about your book and also to extend the uh, duration of your book to the issue of contemporary uh, the the current pandemics and the uh, state of uh, states of emergency in different countries and i i believe that you will interconnect uh, new despotic regimes with kind of reaction reactions in the state of emergency di may be different from those more normal liberal democratic countries we will see but first, uh, to uh, continue with what uh, uh, Boyan has already started in introducing you. So, Professor John Keane is, uh, uh, as Boyan said, uh, Professor of Politics at uh, University and uh, also at Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin. Uh, however, uh, for many years, I do not know exactly from when to when, uh, he used to uh, live and work in Europe, in London, at Westminster University, and he was uh, the founder of the first center of democracy uh, in London. However, he also, uh, we can say that he is the co-founder co and the director of the Sydney Democracy Center. So it is his m m uh, mission, how to say, to uh, uh, to introspect democracy from pra uh, in practice and also articulate uh, theory of democracy uh, ever more. And in that sense, we can say that he is one of the most prominent uh, political theoricians of contemporary times, especially in the field of theory of democracy. From uh, 1988 up nowadays, he published many books. I will mention some of them. Uh, media and democracy translated into 25 languages, then uh, the, uh, uh, Tom Paine uh, biography, then reflections of violence, democracy and civil society, uh, civil society, new images, uh, uh, old images, new visions, uh, a political uh, tragedy in six acts, then uh, democracy and media decadence, uh, the future of representative democracy, violence and democracy. And before that, I did not follow the, the order, I'm sorry, global civil society and the famous book, uh, Life and Death of Democracy. And this last one, New Despotism, I think that these two, how to say, last books uh, make the continuation of uh, uh, the analysis of what's going on with the crisis of uh, democracy in uh, now uh, in our times, and uh, that's enough about his uh, books at, at, at this moment. But I have to mention one detail, very important uh, for John Keane and us from uh, the region of the former Yugoslavia and from Serbia. Uh, John has been uh, for decades the friend of ours and uh, the colleague who stimulates us and uh, 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 has been very open for the communication and uh, supporting us and uh, doing things together with us. One of the famous examples was or is that in, I think in 2001 or two, when Serbia was nowhere in international academic uh, context, uh, John, who uh, through Westminster and this uh, university and Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin initiated uh, the huge European grant. Uh, it was called Six Framework, something like that. Something what what, what preceded to Horizon projects. So he managed somehow to introduce, to invite and introduce Professor Lukashin Pavlovich uh, and Milan Podunavac from Faculty of Political Sciences, and they are here both, and Professor Mladen Lazic from Faculty of Philosophy in Belgrade and myself into that huge project, which was called Civil Society Network. So it was something 
really great for us and uh, it is a special friendship with new left intellectuals from Serbia, from the former Yugoslavia, which John has been keeping very cautiously uh, and continuously. Thank you, John, for that. And I will stop and give the floor to John for his presentation. I, I don't know how long you, you, you have the plan, maybe to speak 30, 40 minutes, and then you, 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 it's up to you because you Thank very much also to have a rich discussion. So you will decide. Well, uh, Fala Dragica, I cannot see you, by the way. I just see today, <laughs> and I'm not I sure. Why. I, no, I I'm not sure why. But I wanted to say, uh, first of all, Dobro jutro svima, uh, or Dobro večer svima, uh, because the sun has already set here. Um, it is uh, a very great pleasure to uh, to be with you all, and I think I remember saying Drago Mia. I'm very pleased uh, to be with you. Uh, there was some mention of uh, by Dragica of um, the former Yugoslavia. I, I would like to remind you that half of former Yugoslavia is here in Australia, <laughs> and believe it or not. Um, I, I have Yugoslav friends here who still refer to themselves as you. Uh, so Yugoslav, Yugos, Yugoslavia is not entirely uh, at all finished. And uh, here we are. It is a great personal pleasure to to be back um, among friends and to meet uh, new colleagues. I wanted to say a special um, zdravo. I can now see. Uh, it's a, uh, a special zdravo to Draghi. It's also uh, to uh, Vukashin Paolovic, who I, I, I have tried to email uh, for probably 10 years, but never made it. But here, thanks to uh, Webex, uh, I am I'm delighted to be in your presence. And also to um, another young, old, a friend, uh, Milan Podjunavac, uh, who uh, I'm also very pleased to see. Maybe you can tilt your camera a little bit, uh, Milan, because I can only see your the, uh, the top of your head at the moment. That's better. Now, now all is, is clear. Um, I would like to have uh, as much discussion as possible with uh, you as a distinguished uh, group. Um, and so I will try with Dragica's help uh, to confine this uh, both to a kind of informal set of, of remarks about uh, this new book, The New Despotism, uh, and to try to do so in not much more than 30 minutes so that we can have uh, a good discussion. And I am, of course, interested in your uh, situation. Uh, because um, Serbia is again making headlines, uh, partly because of um, uh, Mr. Vucic. And um, I'm supposing that what I have to say has some resonance uh, with your situation. I want to do six things. Um, first of all, I, I would like to say something about the, the context in which uh, we are meeting and the context in which this book was born. Um, I want to say, secondly, something about uh, the need for a new taxonomy of political regimes. Uh, and I want to, thirdly, make a case for including and actually resurrecting, including and giving some prominence to the category of despotism. In Serbian, I guess it's despotismus, something like this. I can't hear you. Despotism. We say yeah. despotism. Perfect. Uh, fourthly, I want to say uh, something uh, in summary form about the characteristics of these uh, new despotisms. Uh, fifth, I want to talk briefly about a sting in the tail of this book, which is that this book is as much about uh, despotisms as it is about 
what is going on in so named democracies. And finally, six, I'd like to uh, put on the table some uh, thoughts about the weaknesses of the, these new despotisms, of modes of resistance to these despotisms. And I hope that that will serve as a bridge to uh, uh, a very rich discussion. Let me give, begin with the first point. I think you are very well aware that uh, this is something like a Shakespearean moment uh, in global politics. Uh, there are many strange developments. Uh, there are many surprises and there are many things going on. That not only are difficult to comprehend, but it's as if we lack a language in which to make sense of these uh, developments. Uh, this book is uh, a precautionary tale. It begins with an account written in the past tense of. Uh, all the things that are going on in so named democracies. Um, if you look at the discussion about what is happening in the United States. We are, for example, beginning to hear for the first time talk. Of the United States, the most powerful democracy, a global empire. Uh, as a failed state. This I had not expected in my life. Uh, it is, I think, part of this Shakespearean uh, moment. What I do in this book, however, is to take a deep dive down into uh, the regimes of power of such countries as Turkey, Iran, Russia, China, Vietnam, Singapore, Belarus, Hungary, uh, the Emirates, Qatar, and so on. And to ask the question, despite all of their differences, what is it um, that they share in common? Uh, the book it is, is very clear that there are great differences among these particular regimes. Uh, for example, um, Singapore is probably the most sophisticated of these despotisms, and it is much older. It is a one party system. Uh, it's much older than, for example, Hungary. Or uh, in Saudi Arabia, the, the brewing and consumption of alcohol is strictly forbidden officially. In Russia, uh, as I point out, uh, Alcohol is the elixir of life. I mean, it's 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 a it's a it's an it's a it's a help uh, in getting through daily life. Um, and these differences are important. Some um, uh, the rulers speak in the language of an established religion. In others, uh, there is not. So there are these differences, and I don't make the mistake of thinking that all dogs are Dalmatians, uh, that the earth is flat. But what I am interested in is uh, the common characteristics of uh, power inside these regimes. This book is an anatomy of power. It's an anthropology of power. And it introduces the idea, here I come to the second point, that actually, these this type of power, which I am calling despotism, cannot be grasped by the uh, conventional terms that circulate among intellectuals and journalists, um, politicians and and citizens. Uh, I hope this point will become clearer, but the book is a plea for a new taxonomy. Words matter, as we know in the analysis of the political. And the book is uh, driven by a dissatisfaction with the conventional terms that are currently circulating. For example, uh, if you read Masha Gessen's uh, new book on America, he's a journalist uh, in exile uh, living in the United States. It's a book called Surviving Autocracy. You will see that the concept of autocracy uh, is central for him. I think it's a category mistake. I think 
um, what is striking to be technical is that these uh, regimes are not uh, ruled by a single ruler um, and everybody else falls in line. The relationships of power are much more complicated. There is, for example, a lot of patronage, uh, patron-client relations. Uh, the Chinese call this guangxi. Uh, the Russian term uh, is blat. Uh, the Arabic term is wasta. Um, everybody is interconnected with everybody else from top to bottom. And in a way, everybody is soiled, corrupted uh, by these relationships of power. So to speak about an autocracy seems to me to be misleading, uh, according to the classical Greek understanding of that term. I do not think these are tyrannies. Uh, they are not regimes in which and chaos are the defining characteristics, which is the classical Greek understanding of uh, tyranny. Um, you will see in a moment that I describe in the book um, that the bulk of the population, certainly the middle classes, are not filled with fear. Uh, that lovers uh, stroll hand in hand through the main streets of downtown cities. Uh, they sit sipping um, uh, coffee, uh, drinking wine. There is not the sense that um, there is a tyrant uh, before whom all life is somehow vulnerable. I do not think that these are systems of kleptocracy. Uh, this is um, Karen Dawisha's term to describe uh, Putin's Russia. Um, there is uh, even simpler uh, definitions along these lines. Um, famously, John McCain, Senator John McCain in the United States described Putin's Russia as a gas station masquerading as a state. Uh, the idea that these are systems that steal and rob uh, from the population, there's certainly that that goes on, but the patterns of patronage, the patterns of state expenditure are uh, counterbalances, so to say. And I think in this sense, descriptively, the term kleptocracy is misleading. These are not fascist regimes. Uh, they cannot be described, Allah Hannah Arendt, uh, as totalitarian regimes in which there is totalized fear, in which um, there is permanent mobilization of masses of people. Uh, if anything, as I'll say in a moment, uh, the norm is that the population should not take an interest in public affairs, that they should go shopping, that they should preoccupy themselves with sport, with household life, uh, with work. They should keep their heads down, they can belly ache. Um, in my travels and field work, belly aching is a constant. Everybody is complaining about things, but people do nothing. I do not think um, that these are simply crude state capitalist forms of regime. Uh, today, I understand, is uh, Slovenia's uh, national holiday. Uh, and so I should mention Slavoj Žižek, my old friend, enemy, uh, you know, who thinks that China, for example, is just a perfected um, United States, uh, that what defines them is that they are crude state capitalist uh, regimes. I think this too is a great simplification. And finally, I um, target in particular in this book, uh, this dog tired uh, uh, signifier authoritarianism. And I do so for a couple of reasons, which I'm very happy to discuss. It is uh, a neologism uh, that Sam Huntington played a very central role in uh, around 1970. Um, it has become the most conventionally used term. I have difficulties with it, and the book is an attack on that category for several reasons. Um, I can mention one just at this point. The category of authoritarianism, as it was conceived by American political scientists, uh, came in the form of a dualism. On the one hand is democracy, 
always with an American accent, liberal democracy, in which there are free and fair elections, and authoritarianism, where there are no elections, where there is no democracy. One of the theses of this book is that when you do a probe of the relationships of power inside them, you see that actually the rulers constantly make the point that they are of the people, uh, that this is a democracy, and in some cases, such as the Chinese, um, the claim is that they are a superior form of democracy compared with, for example, what is going on uh, across the Pacific in, in the United States. So this is the second point briefly. Uh, the book is an attempt to uh, resurrect an old, um, mostly forgotten category that has uh, an astonishing history uh, to reconstruct it, um, to apply it uh, to these years of the early 21st century to make sense of uh, regimes of power, uh, which I think are best described as uh, despotisms. I could say um, thirdly something uh, briefly about uh, the category of despotism and its advantages. I think you all know that it has a remarkable history as a term. Uh, probably it has pre-Greek origins, but we know from um, Greek history, from the classical Greek democracies, for instance, that the despotis was the head of a household, the father whose duty was to look after his wife, his children, and slaves. It had no negative connotations. It was a descriptor of a relationship of power in the oikos, in the, in the household. And the despotis had this connotation, very important for later usages, of someone um, to whom uh, loyalty was due. It was a term that appeared in medieval Christianity and uh, it, throughout the church. Again, it did not have um, negative connotations. The term began to develop negative connotations with what I describe in the book as the Orientalist term. It's probably the middle of the 16th century where the term comes to be used to describe China. Uh, the Indian subcontinent, Japan, Persia, the Ottomans. Uh, the idea is that despotism is a kind of power that you find in the East, unlike us, Europe. Uh, a kind of power that puts to sleep um, people. Uh, they become passive subjects of the rule of the Sultan, for example. The most interesting period for me begins with Montesquieu. Um, and I would say the turning point, uh, there is some discussion in the book, is his Persian letters, 1721, where two Persians come to France uh, shortly after Louis XIV has uh, died. And they make all kinds of observations about France and Europe. And not only do they describe uh, the despotism of the seraglio of, of, uh, of Persia. But they make many remarks that suggest, through Montesquieu, that actually there is the danger of despotism inside Europe. Um, at one point, um, Uzbek, uh, who is one of the characters uh, in uh, the Persian letters, says that Louis XIV would feel very much at home in the emperor's palace in uh, uh, of, of the Ottomans. I mean, this is a dangerous remark. Uh, the book uh, was um, published anonymously, uh, and it's later in his Spirit of the Laws, 1748, um, that the term despotism takes on a new meaning. And I describe in the book um, the second half of the 18th century, where the term comes to be um, what Germans call um, uh, a Begriffsgeschichte, you know, it's a term 
uh, is part of the vernacular. Um, it becomes part of the poetry of uh, the American and French revolutions. It is a radical concept which refers here. Um, I reveal a secret of the book. It refers to the problem of arbitrary power. It's a term to describe the arbitrary exercise of power where power is unchecked at any point in a political system. But not only that, the term becomes um, a term to get at the problem of what I call voluntary servitude. You know, the, the paradox, the puzzle for those who use the term in the second half of the 18th century is that despotism is a form of top down power with a lot of inequality of life chances of property, wealth, uh, and so on. But it is a system of power that manages to win the loyalty of its subjects. It is if voluntarily they give themselves away to those who rule. And it is this understanding of uh, despotism that I have tried to um, revive, to um, apply to these regimes. And I think that it's controversial, but I think that the advantages are the following. Not only does the term, an old fashioned term, force us to think again about power uh, and about threats to democracy. It's also a term that gets at the question of voluntary servitude. Uh, this, of course, is La Boeti, and it was Ivan Vevoda who I think translated um, into what was then called Serbo Croatian uh, this uh, remarkable text uh, by La Boeti uh, about voluntary servitude. But the, the, the whole idea of voluntary servitude runs um, through the later history of the category of despotism, and I think it's an important point because. Um, as I use it in this book, the term uh, gets at the, the, the issue of the way power can exercise charm over people, that it can seduce them, that power can operate with a minimum of violent repression. And yet, um, it's a form of power that uh, equals a kind of servitude. This book. Um, also uses the category of despotism because it gets at the problem of arbitrary power. And it is, I think, um, finally, normatively speaking, I think it's a superior term because it does not suppose that the counterfactual, that the normative alternative to despotism is liberal democracy, American style. Um, I agree here with Pierre Rosenblum, uh, and I'm sorry to say this, uh, Dragica, uh, to my chair, but you use the phrase liberal democracy. I think it's a zombie term, uh, and it's a zombie term not only because it, it, it no longer describes uh, life in the United States and indeed in other so-called liberal democracies. India is not a liberal democracy. Taiwan is not a liberal democracy. but. Um, the idea that the alternative, the alternative normatively, politically, is liberal democracy, American style, uh, with its um, the primacy of individual rights and so on. Um, the concept of despotism rejects that way of thinking because it gets at the problem of, uh, of arbitrary power. And if you look at its genealogy, it was used by aristocrats. It was used, of course, by Republicans uh, in the 18th century. It, it was used uh, later by uh, Christians, uh, by uh, critics of uh, the Ottoman uh, Empire. It was, of course, a term that liberals uh, uh, used. Uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, for example, uh, used it. But it does not, normatively speaking, depend upon um, uh, uh, some presumptions about uh, liberal democracy, American style. Fourth point. Um, what are these despotisms? What do they look like? 
I, I'm just going to just um, drop some of the key points, uh, so to say, on the table or uh, on the WebEx uh, uh, table. The, these are regimes that um, are, of course, systems of top-down power. Um, they are remarkably resilient. One of the ideas that runs through this book is uh, that there is a kind of um, capacity, a learning capacity built into these regimes uh, that makes them able to withstand shocks. Uh, their rulers are nimble, clever. These despotisms are smart. Some are smarter than others. And the question that I try to deal with in the bulk of the book is how come? You know, what is the source of their resilience? And the list goes something like this. These are uh, systems uh, of state capitalism. That is for sure. They are systems in which there is plutocracy. There is a great gap typically between rich and poor. But these are systems in which those who rule daily speak about the people. Uh, they go on about democracy. They describe their systems as uh, democratic. Let me quote to you, if I may, um, this may sound uh, strange given the bad press that he gets, but Kim Jong-un, uh, in his New Year speech in 2017, uh, he had this to say. It's typical of every despot. I spent the last year feeling anxious and remorseful for the lack of my ability. I am hardening my resolve to seek more tasks for the sake of the people this year and make redoubled devoted efforts to this end. You know, this is the ruler uh, who <clears throat> is uh, uh, repentant, uh, who uh, presents himself as the avatar of the people, as, as the embodiment of uh, the people. Um, all of these despotisms uh, have rulers who use media to strut. Uh, stages of power to um, present themselves as um, people of the people. Uh, Xi Jinping um, likes to be photographed in a bun shop or riding a bicycle with his daughter. He constantly speaks about the renmin, the people. Uh, when he goes on tour, um, for example, a poverty tour to Western China, it's done in the name of the people. Even, uh, even the crackdown in Xinjiang is done in the name of the people of China. Uh, so this is um, this talk of the people is one method, I think, of uh, of understanding. It's one way of cultivating a certain voluntary servitude. Um, all of the rulers, uh, by the way. Of these despotisms, I say in the book, are skittish. I don't know how to translate this, but they are nervous. They understand that their power depends upon a kind of consent of those they rule. That's why they pay so much attention uh, to, uh, to the people. Um, and in the book, I give illustrations of this uh, nervousness, this skittishness. For example, uh, Putin has a food taster. Every meal he has is pre-digested. Um, Kim Jong-un, when he travels outside of North Korea, uh, has his urine and his feces bagged and sent back to North Korea so that um, there can be no as he sees it, falsification of his medical condition, whatever that medical condition is. All of these systems um, practice clientelism. They are marked by clientelism. I've mentioned this before. Uh, vassalage, you know, it's an old um, medieval term 
I try to revive, to uh, analyze relations of power. Patron-client relations run from top to bottom of the system. If you want to get anything done, you want to get your driver's license um, quickly, would like to have your passport renewed, then you'll pay for that, or you will arrange somehow through someone uh, to have it done uh, more quickly. That is typical of uh, these regimes. Um, I say in the book a bit about a wonderful film uh, by the Iranian filmmaker Mohammad uh, Rasulov. It's called a film, uh, the film is called A Man of Integrity. It is about um, the top to bottom connections in uh, Iran. And of course, uh, what this film shows is that everybody is corrupted, everybody is drawn into um, uh, a system of soiled solidarity. Uh, nobody is clean. Kompromat is, of course, the Russian term to describe this. All of these systems have middle classes that are loyal. And there are others, skilled, unskilled workers, even sections of the poor who are loyal. But the middle classes uh, show no um, strong inclination to have liberal democracy Francis Fukuyama style. They rather, the Chinese case is clear. Uh, I'm often in China, a lot of my work has been translated into Chinese. I, I, you know, the middle class is somewhere between 300 and 400 million people, self-described middle classes. And the current feeling among those middle classes is loyalty. They're actually quite proud that China um, is uh, regaining its dignity and proud of what the government has done in this pandemic, which is, however falsified the data is, um, what is going on in China is not uh, equivalent to what is going on in the United States. All of these um, uh, systems in which there are polygarchs, it's a Hungarian uh, neologism, so uh, at various levels in the system, business people are connected with, with, um, with political governmental officials. Uh, governmental officials, even at the lowest levels, make money. Uh, they become wealthy out of um, local business. And local businesses have uh, privileged access to governing institution. Mesharos, um, one of uh, Victor Orban's oldest friends uh, became a multi, multi, multi millionaire. I think he was by training a plumber. Um, he was in debt. He, he was not at all important. He's become one of the richest men uh, in Hungary, uh, uh, an example of a polygarch. In these despotisms, I draw this to this fourth point to a close very soon. In these despotisms, there is no rule of law. There is no independent judiciary. Um, despots love to attack what Edoyan calls the juristocracy. Um, this is not to say that these despotisms are systems of lawlessness. They actually rule through law. There is a kind of simulation of the rule of law. In the book, I give the example of trial of Bo Xi Lai, uh, who was the great power opponent of Xi Jinping. And the way he was put on trial, the character of the trial, is a kind of model of how you do it. It looks like um, due process of law. It looks like a simulation of law, but uh, of rule of law, but um, it's actually rule uh, through law. All of these systems are media saturated. I'm very interested in the way that those who rule use this unfinished communications revolution of our time to uh, reinforce their power and the resilience uh, of their systems. All of them have uh, sophisticated uh, media managers. Uh, Errol Orchak uh, was Erdogan's uh, a key advisor. Um, Surkov, who was like the stage director of Putin 
uh, is another example. And it explains why um, there's heavy usage of Instagram and Facebook. Um, Prime Minister Lee in Singapore has more than a million Facebook followers. Um, and you will see when you look at the media politics or the mediated politics of these regimes uh, that is highly sophisticated and has lots of parallels uh, with um, media politics outside of these despotisms. Um, if you've never watched uh, Putin do his pre-Christmas uh, end of year press conference, you really must. You know, it's two hours, three hours, uh, an unscripted performance where he plays the role of an elected prime minister or some elected president uh, before uh, an audience of fawning journalists. It's an extraordinary performance. Uh, and this is uh, somehow typical. And one last thing about media, these are not, um, straightforwardly totalitarian systems because um, a measure of openness within digital network information flows is maintained. And these regimes do that uh, because they need early warning detector systems. Uh, they need spaces in which um, disgruntled subjects vent their frustrations. There are, of course, tight controls. Uh, but uh, these are systems in which there is a kind of calculated uh, repression of uh, freedom of uh, communication. On the question of violence, violence in these regimes typically is stocking, masked, it's camouflaged. Uh, these are not systems um, in which uh, Violence is the key resource of power. It is hidden away. It is used in highly targeted ways. Um, sometimes it goes wrong. Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, I give in the, uh, in the book the example of a Russian banker uh, who was a victim of uh, the early Putin years. Oleg uh, Novoselsky is his name, kidnapped uh, by men in not in uniform, um, taken to an undisclosed location, drugged, placed in a big barrel of wet cement, and allowed in the hot day sun in a secluded area to die in that barrel of cement. The barrel was then thrown uh, into the Moscow River. Uh, the culprits uh, were uh, not found for many years. Finally, um, it is important to say again that state um, welfare, state spending, is very important feature of these regimes and why they are not kleptocracies. 50% of the Russian population, it's estimated, uh, lives, its main source of income is the state. Uh, in China, two thirds of GDP is, is, um, is circulated through the state. Hence, massive expansion of um, tertiary education, uh, the, the implementation of a pension system, of a healthcare system which is being rolled out. Uh, these are systems in which um, uh, power depends upon these kinds of uh, expenditures. Now, um, I want fifth and finally, I'm not sure about my time. It's not, uh, it's, it's a few minutes to seven o'clock in the evening <laughs> for me. Uh, but I want to say, um, finally, two points. Uh, fifth, perhaps the surprise uh, for many readers of this book is that as you are reading it, you begin to see that actually many of the things that are described about these despotisms 
are alive and well inside so named democracies. It's not only um, the gap between rich and poor. It is um, that uh, elections are with a lot of dark money are practiced in both systems. Um, inside actually existing democracies, there is a lot of what we've come to call gaslighting through media. You know, the spreading of toxic language, um, of falsehoods, of bullshit uh, designed to confuse peoples, to turn them off politics. That happens systematically in these despotisms, and it's happening as well in uh, so named democracies. We could, I could add um, other features in common, uh, including uh, the rise of a new populism uh, led by demagogues, Bolsonaro, number 45, I don't use his name anymore, number 45 um, in the United States, Duterte, uh, Katinsky, Erdogan, and probably your Mr. Vucic. I mean, th th these um, th these populist demagogues are, in a way, um, uh, made manifest in the despotisms in a form of state-managed populism. So the point I'm making here is that um, there is uh, there is not a dualism between despotism and democracy, descriptively speaking. But actually, it's one of the advantages of the term that Tocqueville um, uh, showed us, for instance, that when you speak about despotism, you think of power sharing constitutional democracy as on the same scale, on the same uh, scale, different, but um, vulnerable to despotism. And um, as Tocqueville famously said in um, uh, democracy in, on Amérique. You know, the thing that democracies, modern democracies, should most fear is a new kind of modern despotism. And that idea runs certainly through the book. Finally, um, I have uh, said to you already that these regimes uh, display a remarkable resilience. They have a learning capacity. They are interested in what Chinese intellectuals call good governance. Yang hao de ji is the Chinese uh, phrase. And striking, as I describe in the book, are the learning mechanisms that are institutionalized in these despotisms. All of them practice elections. They are kind of learning mechanisms for spotting disgruntlement of parts of the population, for instance. All of these regimes depend upon think tanks. They use public opinion polling agencies. Um, in the Emirates, uh, there is a program um, of happiness forums. You know, the idea is to, is, to, is to institutionalize public forums where people speak about their unhappiness. The idea is to, to learn why it is that um, the subjects are happy. And all of this um, suggests that um, these despotisms um, contain within them shock absorbers. They are more resilient and probably more durable than many scholars and diplomats, politicians, journalists, and others have supposed. Some of them more resilient than others. The Singaporeans, for example, have been practicing since the 1980s, uh, what they call a REACH program, um, you know, stakeholder forums, tea sessions, uh, where various um, stakeholders inside the regime are encouraged to communicate with those who rule in a one party system. So this raises the question of their weaknesses and what are the prospects for um, uh, weakening them or defeating them, that's supposing that 
that you are interested in rule of law uh, and power sharing, the public monitoring and scrutiny of power, what I call monitory democracy, um, that you are interested in our old topic of civil uh, drujba, civil society and its importance, um, that you are interested in the reduction of violence, uh, in pluralism, and so on. The question is, what are the prospects um, inside these despotisms and inside democracy for the preventing uh, the spread of despotism? Well, the future is, of course, uh, uh, hidden from our eyes. It's an unsent text message. Um, we don't know because we do not have glass balls. We do not know what the future will be. In the book, I suggest uh, two lines of thinking in reply to this uh, question. Um, actually, three. One is uh, a priority is to understand uh, how these despotisms, new despotisms work. It's very important to understand their intricacies. And for this, as I've um, tried to say, a new language is needed for analyzing uh, power in these regimes. Secondly, it does seem to me that potentially the one central weakness of these despotisms is that despite the learning mechanisms that they institutionalize, there is a permanent shortage of accountability mechanisms that can prevent um, the foolishness and the abuse of power. A very good example is the opening weeks of the birth of uh, the coronavirus pestilence in China. If you look at the last days of December of 2019 and the early earliest three weeks of 2020, you will see what I'm talking about um, uh, very clearly. The part for various reasons did everything to suppress um, what the doctors and then uh, the uh, laboratory analysts in Shanghai and other cities were telling them. They were being told that there is a new virus, um, it's a new strain, it's uh, lethal, um, we need to act now, and the, the local party in Wuhan did everything to crush it, to crush that dissent. That, I think, um, is an example of the way that um, these despotisms um, suffer from the arbitrariness of their power. And it is a key reason, it seems to me, uh, why um, democracy understood as accountability, restraint of power. It's what I've tried to do in my work and uh, in my life to redefine what democracy is. It's much more than elections, free and fair. It is the permanent restraint of arbitrary power, the, the humbling of power, the uh, attempts, public attempts to prevent the foolishness and the evils of arbitrary power. And finally, um, I offer the suggestion in the book that perhaps the most effective way of dealing with this new despotism problem is to clean up um, what I call the Augean stables uh, actually existing democracies. You know, King Augeus in Greek mythology had, I think, a herd of 3,000 oxen, and for 30 years he never cleaned the stables. Uh, so you can imagine that there was quite a lot of uh, excrement, shall we say, and it was eventually Hercules who comes along and cleans the stables. Um, that's a metaphor for describing what I think uh, is the most important uh, weapon against this new despotism, wherever it is, which is to actually protect, but also uh, to uh, further develop democratic mechanisms uh, that are incompatible and that actually undermine that despotism. That means in practice, at least um, cleaning up elections, it means um, 
the protection of rule of law institutions. It means uh, protecting public service institutions, for example, broadcasting. And we are back to our old topic um, from the early 1980s uh, that, uh, that we shared, the importance of civilian družba, the importance of the protection of civil society um, against a despotism that actually has no love of civil society and does everything it can to destroy it, um, as we see in Russia and China and Turkey and Belarus and Vietnam and, and growing numbers of other cases. Oh, Fala Lipo, that's all I have to say. And I'm sorry I went on for more than 30 minutes, uh, but I hope that I have given to you uh, uh, a good sense of, of what this book um, is, is trying to do. It's my great privilege to present it to you. Thank you, thank you, John. And uh, please, the floor is open for questions. Uh, uh, I'll unmute myself for a short second. Uh, so we have this rule that the priority goes to those who figured out how to work the little virtual hands, and the first one was definitely <laughs> Professor Vukashin Pavlovich. So, so the the first question is uh, is by Vukashin Pavlovich. Please, Professor, you're unmuted. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yes. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm so glad to see you and all other friends. Uh, I'm just in the period of recovery after the very difficult uh, cancer operation uh, just at the beginning of this pandemic crisis. And uh, I'm really glad to, to see you again in this virtual <laughs> way. And um, of course, I'm uh, very uh, aware about the importance of the topic and your book. Uh, and uh, you, you, you are really right uh, that uh, the term and concept of despotism has long history. But my point is that uh, uh, the, and what I found in your uh, book, that is the, the the new despotism is more oriented to the relations between uh, uh, despotism and uh, democracy. And uh, I found, in fact, uh, uh, as far as I know, that uh, Tocqueville was the first who used uh, the term new despotism in that sense, in the sense of uh, relations between, uh, between uh, uh, despotism and, and democracy. Uh, Actually, actually, uh, Vukashin, it comes earlier, and it's uh, before Tocqueville, I discovered. Uh, there are writers, um, journalists, who uh, also put this problem on the table, uh, that, that despotism um, is not the simple opposite of democracy, that democracies are always in danger of becoming despotic. Yes, and uh, in any case, uh, all of these approaches, uh, related and connected with the new despotism syntagma are very important for uh, uh, un understanding the today's situation. And uh, that is the reason why uh, the, the influence of this neo Tocquevillian uh, uh, stream in uh, social sciences and cultural studies are so important to today. Um, one, I think that. Um, um, in in uh, generally speaking, and especially in our case in Serbia, the uh, the new despotism uh, is uh, present here in in one uh, pretty primitive way, I should say, and. Uh, uh, generally speaking. Uh, uh, any kind of crisis, especially this kind of crisis, like by pan pan pandemia, uh, coronavirus uh, crisis, is uh, uh, the best uh, way to to impose the state of emergency. 
And this is yeah. the best framework for any kind of authoritarian type of political regime, uh, like uh, here in Serbia. But generally speaking, I, I am afraid that even in more democratic uh, uh, societies, this kind of, of uh, uh, danger exists. Um, what uh, we can see uh, that the, 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 we face the global problem, but the answers for pandemic crisis were uh, offered uh, by, by na nation state level. There, there is no global uh, strategy for uh, this kind of um, uh, answers. And, and um, uh, by the way, I think that uh, Condona, uh, co uh, coronavirus is uh, some kind of message uh, sent by nature and by Earth that uh, to, to our human species that we are too destructive and too aggressive and uh, this will be not the last pandemia. Next time will be maybe even even worse. Uh, yeah. In any case, uh, what we can see everywhere, not only in uh, authoritarian regimes like in Serbia and uh, new democracies, uh, but also in all democracies, that the uh, healthy system is not prepared and, and political system in general uh, and state is not prepared uh, uh, for for um, good answers of this type of of uh, crisis, and there there are as you mentioned there there were a lot of there are a lot of uh, uh, indicators that this situation was abused uh, for uh, the power holders for corruption for uh, incorrect uh, information about the numbers of disease and uh, especially victims of, of disease. There are estimations in Serbia, for example, that the uh, number of uh, uh, dead ca uh, cases uh, were maybe two-thirds more than it was announced in, in, in the public. Well. Um, and uh, my, 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 my question is uh, related to you personally because uh, I, 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 I couldn't remember even when you was the last time in in uh, our space here in in Belgrade, uh, but it was 2000, 2009. Yeah, 2009. more than one decade, and. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, my question is, is, what are possibilities for you and when is your next visit to Berlin, for example, to, to, to connect this visit to, 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 to your um, um, visit to Belgrade? Uh, I have some contacts with the Australian Embassy and I mentioned them, uh, my wish to, to invite you and to organize one debate uh, about uh, this topic of new despotism and uh, related to your book, of course, uh, to, to our faculty. And uh, it would be more uh, very important for our, uh, for, for our students and uh, scholars in, in, in general. And uh, um, I am in, in one pretty difficult situation. I just, uh, uh, um, had a very difficult uh, cancer operation just at the beginning of, of pandemic crisis, and I'm now in a period of recovery. Uh, I am waiting for next month's uh, chemotherapy, but uh, you know, I am always in this kind of conditions. You can uh, recall this beginning of 90s when I, <laughs> I met I, I, in London. <laughs> Also, after one very difficult operation, but uh, one good idea was was born that uh, in this cafe near to, to Westminster University, 
yes. about the suppressed civil society project and really yes. I, I can say in spite of the fact that i am pretty older than you that you are my best teacher really and <laughs> <laughs> I try to teach from young scholars stop, stop, and even stop. my students. Thank you. Well, fala, fala vam, Bukashin, dear Bukashin. Um, a couple of things. Uh, I was um, been invited to be in uh, uh, Wien uh, from the first of October for three months, uh, and I was hoping. Um, um, Milan uh, Podunavats knows this. I was hoping that, of course, I would come to see you. Um, at the moment, the, speaking of emergency rule, the difficulty is that no, no Australian citizen is allowed out of the country. I mean, we are locked. We are locked uh, inside the borders. I mean, this is this is. You know, we practice the government's practice this sovereignty uh, for the last twenty five years. You know, no illegal immigrants. Uh, but now the sovereignty principle is applied to citizens as well. So there are no flights. Uh, I can beg the federal government um, uh, bureau to leave, but it will be declined. And the, the federal minister said uh, only last week that it looks like he gave the hint that this would be until early next year. So I have um, I have um, postponed my visit. That means I would come in early January and be in uh, Europe for at least three or four or five months of of next year. So it would be my great 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 personal honor and pleasure to to uh, come to Biograd and um, to to be with you and and other friends and and new colleagues and certainly to discuss. Um, to discuss this topic that I think has uh, a lot of resonance uh, with what is happening in uh, inside Serbia, as as I understand it, what is at stake uh, is um, I didn't intend this, but what is at stake is described uh, in in this book. It's analysed in some uh, detail. Briefly about your remarks, um, I think uh, about emergency rule. It is astonishing for me that well-functioning, um, power-sharing constitutional democracies uh, almost overnight were able to impose emergency rule with almost no resistance. This and and given that um, this pestilence. Uh, is not over, and it is possible there will be a second uh, or third wave, as happened with the so-called Spanish flu. This means emergency rule will last for a considerable time, with the suspension of, of um, effectively habeas corpus. Uh, I cannot travel, you know, to my native South Australia to see my family, because borders are closed inside the the country. So, uh, if you think that um, descriptively the distinction between democracy and despotism is hard, that there is a dualism, think again, because what we have going on uh, inside uh, so named democracies is um, our examples of emergency rule and the, the manipulation of people's most intimate behavior. You know, uh, I was locked inside my house for two weeks when I returned from Oxford in the middle of March. Um, I, ha I, I shook the first hand only one week ago. I gave a hug to someone only uh, one week ago. I had a coffee in a, in a cafe for the first time for three months, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you are right about the significance of this. And I think one other remark, I think you are right about the environmental uh, lesson um, that this that this pestilence holds for the world. It must be analyzed as an environmental issue. Um, it is certainly not the first 
but I think I'm not the only one around this table who feels that um, something very big and significant is being born. We don't know what it is, but in matters of power, in matters of power sharing, I'm sure I'm not the only one who worries that this is the beginning of a, an, an entirely new phase in the practice of democracy in terms of the ideals of rule of law and so on, where actually there's a permanent weakening. That is a real danger. And not only that, but um, it's an idea that I have been developing for the last 15 years or so um, about the normative advantage of democratic accountability. The rule is that when there is no democratic accountability of power, whether in the field of corporations or in our relationship with nature, uh, with biomes, or in the field of government, for instance, when there is no power accountability, where there is no monetary democracy, then things go wrong. And sometimes they go wrong in um, disastrous, catastrophic ways. This pestilence is a case in point. Um, and in an essay which was published in so-called Croatian um, that I, I did send to uh, Boyan, and perhaps you, you would like to circulate it, I quote um, a Taiwanese uh, woman anthropologist who is the main author of pandemics in China. And what she shows is that um, uh, with SARS, with HIV AIDS, with leprosy and several other viruses, that, that the Chinese system is a breeder uh, of these environmental uh, disruptions, you know, known as pandemics. And what she points out, her name is uh, Liu uh, Xiaohua, uh, what she points out is that this Corona-19, um, COVID-19 virus, is a repetition of an old pattern where you have corrupt systems of power uh, that allow these things to happen, try to cover it up, and then that makes the problem worse. Um, you may not know, one last remark, I was uh, teaching summer school in Wuhan um, uh, in, the first half of, uh, in the first half of August, and I actually went to the market, this amazing market the size of a football field, and I could not believe, it was strange at the time, uh, all these weird animals being sold uh, in this food and fish market. Um, why do they sell these strange animals? Partly because there is, there was strong belief among millions of Chinese in ancient Chinese medicine, you know, that the tail of a snake would be good for your uh, cancer, or it would be good for your testosterone or something. And partly because a lot of money is made and the party protects uh, local businesses that are, it's a form of corruption. So, um, Liu Xiaohua's point is that um, this is typical, uh, and it's for me a confirmation of why democracy, um, there's a new normative argument for democracy. Democracy um, is a way of preventing the abuse of power wherever it is exercised. It is a way, therefore, of preventing stupidity of um, unaccountable power, and it's also a way of preventing catastrophes of this kind. So um, this environmental or this green thought is thanks to you, uh, my friend, going back at least now 40 years, 40 years, uh, this, um, this is uh, this idea that democracy is important for preventing humans from abusing their power, of doing stupid things, of experimenting with uh, uh, things, putting animals together, for example, in markets. Um, 
this is the best weapon we so far have invented to prevent um, the abuses and the foolishness and sometimes the catastrophes of, of power. This pestilence, I think, is proof of that. And on a positive note, it helps explain why those polities that were the most open, where there was um, clear narrative of political leaders, uh, where there was honesty, where there was representation of citizens and medics, Taiwan, South Korea, New Zealand, and I would also say uh, Australia. Um, it's a complicated story, but but and also Germany, uh, where you have democracies where there is an attempt to restrain the abuse of power, you know, by demagogues, uh, then the control of this pestilence has been much higher and the and the deaths that followed um, much lower. When you don't have um, effectively monetary democracy in action, when you have a president who believe or a prime minister with blonde hair, you know, who who believed in herd immunity, who denied, who lied, um, I mean, it it multiplied the the tragedy, uh, as we see in the case of the United Kingdom and in the United States. So um, I'm sorry for the long winded reply, but you ask these very important questions. And uh, okay, so we have a short time uh, left, and we have two questions. Uh, first, uh, the colleague, I don't know her name, please. Uh, it's and then to Nasir. In, uh, in presentation. And one important thing is that what you're talking about is um, connecting a lot of despotisms, but there may be different uh, kinds of know-how in different countries. And I'm from Georgia. I study in Budapest, and we also have this experience what happens in Hungary. Me and Theodora is also studying there. And, but in Georgia also, we have some our own know-hows. And you mentioned nobody is clean. Uh, so in Georgia, that means that there was no lustration law. So after, so after transition, no lustration law, so nobody is clean. Uh, apart from that, social media. Social media is dividing so civil society that could unite together because they somehow simulate protest by uh, attacking each other groups that could be affiliated together but you every day you see that these people destroy each other and on the the third point i wanted to make uh is that we have our own know-how in georgia we have this uh, billionaire who came from russia oligarch who is not actually a prime minister, but some uh, de facto leader of the party, and he changes prime ministers every one year. So he's this, this okay, not so fast maybe, but very fast. So the idea is that people cannot even find a target. So previous president, maybe he was like um, zero tolerance and very repressive and everything, but at least you could find the target who you blame for all the things. But now it's really, it's, it's just indifference all, all across the board. So yes, you are so right, at least in Georgian context, it's the problem that people who are dissatisfied and another aspect that I was thinking, this could be shared by other jurisdictions as well, but in Georgia, we have this path dependency of parties, just two parties, and both are not clean. So we don't find an alternative. So you go and you vote, it's democracy, but you vote for the least, for you, you, you vote for somebody who you hate least. You hate all, but you hate somebody less. So I think, your points are like very important and we have different countries have their own know-how and they learn very well how to outsmart us but is there anything that we can learn to outsmart them for instance this populist we criticize populism a lot but i think there should be a turn to realization that actually Yes, populism is a catching guy. There are some popular demands that we have to address. So if there are new groups that are going to emerge, I think their focus should be that, yes, populism is not bad, just a different kind of populism is required. 
And one more thing, just as to keep the tradition of inviting you some places, we're uh, we're going to be kicked out to Vienna next year, to Central European University, and me and Theodora study there on doctoral program. So if you are there in January, it will be in the same city, and we will be very happy to invite you for our uh, doctoral seminar each week. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dragica, would you like to take the other question and uh, then maybe I... Tanasia, <laughs> please. Yes. yes. Can, you, can you hear me, actually? Yes, I can. Very good. Ah. I'm very happy to uh, be able to listen to you, John Keen. I, uh, of course, read your books and I listened a lot about you from Dragica. So I, uh, it's already like I know you. Um, it has been... Uh, oh. Yeah, it has, so it has been an immense pleasure to, uh, to, to listen to you now in live, uh, although uh, <clears throat> uh, virtually. Um, and um, uh, I think everything you said, all the characteristics of the new despotism which you have uh, pinpointed, they completely match to the Serbian situation. So there I would have nothing to add, nothing to, um, uh, to disagree. I completely concur with you. Now, um, the new despotism is a new taxonomy. Um, I, I hear here another echo of, uh, of uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who also, speaking of federalism, but without naming it, um, felt that there was a new term, that there is a new concept, there is a new system of government um, in the democracy of America. He, he clearly states it, but he doesn't know how to name it. I'm not, he was right there. I mean, he was right there about the federation. He did not know how to name it. Um, I, I'm not sure so much whether we are at present um, in, in front of a, 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 a kind of a political system which can englobe everything you have put in. Um, I, you, you made reference at the end to the uh, uh, populism. And I, I, I think that um, the, the works which have been published recently by uh, Jan Werner, Miller, Paul Blocker and uh, Ziblata and Levitsky and others, um, they quite um, uh, rightly uh, also pinpoint the nature of, um, of populism as a technology of um, coming to power and maintaining in power by um, uh, more uh, uh, using abusive language than having a particular ideology. That there is also uh, that strand of political uh, theory which insists that populism has a particular ideology. I don't think that it has a particular ideology, and you were also right in that. You didn't mention ideology at all. I mean, everything uh, that you have uh, characterized, I mean, everything that you have said is actually about the uh, manners of, of, about the technology of governing. And there, I completely concur with you. Only mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether, um, uh, uh, I, I also feel sometimes um, <laughs> that we uh, are definitely in front of the new um, uh, phenomena, uh, something like um, uh, in the 30s of the 20th century. Um, I, I can follow more closely Council of Europe states, and I can see that there, um, whether we speak of Serbia, of, um, of other former Yugoslav states, uh, 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 accepted Croatia and Slovenia, especially so Macedonia, Montenegro, um, uh, uh, Russia, of course, um, we are still in my opinion, in the concept of pseudo-democracy. Um, I, I, again, concur entirely with you. Democracy is not just about elections. And this is why I'm not saying electoral democracy. Mm -hmm. because, because we don't have fair elections. Um, so not even that. So elections, let alone, uh, we don't even have elections. So we have, we have um, a, a regress to a pseudo-democracy where um, elections are actually um, uh, rigged. So they do not anymore serve to legitimize the power. But as you have rightly pointed out, we, are, we have already all those uh, mechanisms of, of persuading people to love the leader. And there again, I'm not sure that we are very much different from, let's say, um, uh, post-Second World War Yugoslavia authoritarian states like post-Second World War Yugoslavia. There are no elections, not even in this context of pseudo-democracy. So 
uh, I mean, we have pluralism, some kind of pluralism, but very restricted, very actually controlled, I would say. Um, so it's not, uh, but you didn't mention elections either in your uh, characteristics of the new democracies, of course, for very good reason, because you have put China and, and I think it's just that it's too broad, you know, it's too broad, the, num the, 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 the number of countries and too diversified countries which you have put under the same umbrella. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, in my opinion, um, maybe disregarding the, the concept of populism that you write about um, in, in your book, um, Life and Death of Democracy, uh, when you speak of, um, of the narodnost in, uh, in Russia. Uh, but this is a different, of course, it's a 21st century populism, anti-pluralism, anti-elitism, antagonizing rhetorics. Um, and that is something that we can find as well in uh, Serbia, uh, uh, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, but also in the States, in the, in the, um, um, in the words of the 45th, as well as um, uh, uh, among many politicians in other liberal, well, to use the Dragica's term, liberal democracies. Oh. Uh, so we, we see them uh, also in the, in the face of Nigel Farage in um, in in, uh, in in the UK, uh, Marine Le Pen in in in, in France, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, Matteo Salvini in Italy, and so on and so forth. So just to um, wrap up my question, um, I'm not convinced that we are here in the presence of a term which can um, describe uh, all the systems that you have um, uh, uh, named. Uh, I don't see yet what is so fundamentally different from the um, uh, authoritarian systems of the Yugoslavian type that you know, that you're familiar with. And thirdly, um, why not yet stick to the, to the populism? Speak of populism as a technology of coming to power and maintaining its power. Because everything that you said is about the technology, you know. And I think that populism still allows us to, um, uh, to, 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 to look at all these systems, including the states and others, through these lenses. Okay, that's my question, comment. Thank you. Wow. Uh, no, no, wait, wait. We, uh, we passed over uh, the scheduled time, but uh, there are a few more questions. I, I bet uh, uh, the guys who, who, is, who are going to put questions to be short, very short and precise. So, Teodora, Milan, uh, is there uh, anybody else? So, I wanted to ask about why uh, something similar to what Anasia said, uh, why didn't you introduce into the context uh, reconsideration of the whole issue in, in the uh, neoliberal and globalized framework but it's not necessary to respond to it so theodora and uh, milan very shortly please and then john will conclude with his uh, responses um, okay thank you a lot that you can hear me um thank you professor keen for a lovely lecture i will just i'll try to be short because i had a lot of comments i just like to refer to Professor uh, Tanasia's last remark, why, for example, I think that populism wouldn't be a good um, framework for this kind of discussion, uh, simply because there is no, uh, same as these definitions of um, totalitarian systems, autocratic, autocratic systems, there is no single definition of populism, that's one thing, and the other thing, there is a whole line of literature which actually um, supports populism as a legitimate um, means of gaining power so basically there is the literature which says that populism can actually be good for example left populism in the u.s currently um mm. so i just think that would blur the discussion and um and actually uh, wouldn't really show what is at stake in the countries such as hungary poland serbia because there is a difference um even in um maybe populism is a rhetoric uh, so as a, as a rhetoric, it, it's a good means, but there is much more in those countries in populism, I would say. So that's yeah. Mm -hmm. Pala. Okay, right now, could I add something? 
<clears throat> First of all, uh, it's a great pleasure to see all of you. I apologize for uh, some trouble starting this uh, session. Um, uh, I would uh, say... I, I, can't, to... I can't see you, Milan. Yeah, do you see me? No, I can't, uh, but um, maybe you need to click on Do you on hear your... me? Do you, oh, I you... hear you very clearly. Yes. Do, you, you, do, do, you, do you hear me? Yes, very yeah, clearly. Of course. <clears throat> uh, I would uh, I would uh, stress just the two points. Uh, first of all, uh, the great pleasure to see all of you and uh, John uh, in particular. Uh, once again, I would say that uh, John provided uh, us uh, the innovation, refreshing and redeeming classical concept of uh, uh, despotism and uh, describing uh, the new type of political regime, which is uh, by itself uh, the enemy of democracy, enemy of representative, uh, power sharing and monitoring uh, democracy. And uh, another point, uh, such uh, uh, very short uh, backed uh, on uh, John's and particularly on Montesquieu about democracy and despotism. I would recall that uh, pandemic of a fear increasing something which I would uh, define as uh, public distrust uh, and the public disillusions uh, for democracy. And back to Montesquieu. Democracy is fragile political regime. Democracy of republic precisely seeks very special conditions and a very special Republican public values and the public virtues. Certainly such uh, public values uh, uh, are difficult to generate, even harder to maintain. And uh, let me, following Montesquieu, my final note, uh, it is not uh, the main problem in contemporary political society. Uh, how to, how much Republican values and uh, virtues need democracy, but how to avoid that Republic or democracy collapses into the open despotism. And it is something we are passing right now in Serbia. And we have something uh, which is uh, back to John. And the, to, uh, to our another friend, John Wolfgang Merkel, it is something which we could define as normalization of a different form of a authoritarian political regime. Uh, Wolfgang wrote a short essay titled Oligarchic Cartel of Autocrats, naming uh, Xi Jinping, uh, Putin, Lukashenko, Orban, and so on. I would add Vucic and Djukanovic. You know, some Balkan, some Balkan figure. And I would announce to all of my friends, all of you know, I'm in process of preparing a new manuscript which would explore the Serbian long walk, John, to new despotism. Okay, thank you. Just to come. <laughs> I, I, I unfortunately couldn't see you, Milan, but um, I hear you very, very well. Um, Dragita, I'm in your hands. Please, please go on with your uh, concluding remarks and the responses, and then we will finish. I, I, I will try to be brief. Um, I wanted to say uh, a very warm uh, uh, many thanks for these great questions. Uh, I have done quite a few of these um, webinars in the last several weeks. This, I think, is for me the most interesting. Uh, I mean, very intelligent, to the point, uh, and exposing some potential weaknesses in, in this book. And 
for those remarks. I'm very grateful. I can't um, give detailed replies to to uh, to each of you, but there are some uh, points uh, that um, I think um, I learned from you, and and so to say, I I give back a gift. One point is that this book deliberately makes a case for thinking about the genus and not at this stage being preoccupied with species. The point is that there are novelties of this form of power. We haven't seen um, this kind of power, uh, whether it's Saudi or Erdogan in Turkey, or Putin, or uh, Xi Jinping's China, we haven't seen this kind of power before. And uh, the basic provocation is that instead of um, objecting uh, too quickly to the need to recognize the importance of context, yes, to recognize the, the, the subtypes, we should um, intellectually, because it has political implications intellectually, we should concentrate on the task of examining genus, of looking at the congruities among uh, these uh, different uh, regimes uh, rather than the incongruities. And that is a point that um, comes through very clearly in the book. Uh, and I don't know whether it's entirely convincing. Um, I think uh, Tanasiya was not so convinced of this, but that emphasis on the genus rather than the species is, I think, strategically uh, an important uh, move to make at this uh, moment. Secondly, um, again, Tanasiya, uh, I didn't mention the concept of ideology, and you reminded me that I forgot to say something about languages through which these despotisms operate. Uh, you know, it is the Max Weber principle that each polity, each type of regime typically has uh, one uh, mode of legitimacy. What empirically is very striking about all of these despotisms in all of their variation is that there is no here the world is different than Hannah Arendt and her uh, preoccupation with totalitarianism, understandable. These regimes are ones in which there is a kind of polysemic quality to the languages through which uh, ruling takes place. Uh, let me give you a Chinese example that every Chinese um, uh, subject knows. Um, in the course of one day, Xi Jinping can speak about ancient Chinese civilization, 5,000 years old. Um, in the next breath, he can uh, speak about socialism. In the next breath, he speaks about the importance of um, the development of the productive forces and of economic growth, almost neoliberal language. In the next breath, uh, he will speak about democracy and uh, when towards the end of the day, he will give a speech that could have been written by Greenpeace International about the um, eco-civilizational challenge that we are facing. Now, when you put these different languages together, they don't add up. Uh, they are a kind of bricolage. Um, they are uh, a kaleidoscope of languages which have great functional advantages for those who rule because they can uh, dress in a coat of many colors that they can be many things to different parts of the population. Uh, the idea that there is a single ruling ideology uh, simply doesn't apply to these regimes. They are not. Uh, in the strict sense of that category of ideology, they are not ideological regimes. I quote in the book, um, actually, 
uh, the current Prime Minister of Singapore, who gave a long interview where he says exactly that. We don't need rigid ideologies. We need flexibility in the way that you know, we, we govern. And uh, it is a striking feature, I think, of, of all of these uh, despotisms. Um, also to Tanasia, um, I will say something to others in a moment. Um, you raise the question of pseudo democracy through the book. I speak um, and in a previous book about China, I speak, I introduce the term phantom democracy. I, I don't know how it is in uh, Serbian, but to speak of a phantom democracy is to defy the distinction between true and false. You know, a phantom pregnancy, any woman will tell you that a phantom pregnancy is real and not real. Um, a phantom limb that has been amputated in war is, let's say, an arm and a leg that exists and it doesn't exist. And the category of phantom is very important because what I think is that these despotisms are systems in which uh, there is a widespread feeling that they are somehow democratic. And yet, on the other hand, they are not. And, and that is a lived experience. Uh, the statistically reliable opinion polls we have uh, in China suggest regularly that around 80% of the population say they live in a democracy. Now, if you're um, Freedom House, you say it's all bullshit. You know, it's, it's, it's that they've been, they've been brainwashed. Actually, what I try to say in this book is that actually it's more complicated and that um, uh, this is a lived feeling, a lived, a lived perception uh, that reveals that there is a kind of reality of, um, of that uh, sense of it being a democracy. But on the other hand, a systematic violation of it in institutional form on a daily basis. And it's a paradox, but phantom democracy is, uh, is uh, my term. I was very interested in the discussion um, uh, with Theodora um, uh, uh, adding her important thoughts towards the end, the discussion about populism. Um, these despotisms have a populist quality but the category is too narrow uh, to capture, I think, um, the broader power dynamics, uh, the geometry of power, if you like, in these uh, despotisms. They have a populist quality in the sense that each of them typically has a demagogue um, who plays the role of the embodiment of the people. Uh, actually, um, Milan um, taught me this a long time ago uh, in his interest, early interest in Caesarism. And what uh, I say in the book uh, is drawn from, uh, from uh, Milan's work. In particular, I quote this Venezuelan author who in the same year as Max Weber um, published his um, Politik als Beruf. Um, Loriano Vianilla Lanz, a Venezuelan uh, scholar and diplomat, wrote a book. Um, it's not translated, unfortunately, into other languages except French. Uh, the title in English would be Democratic Caesarism. And basically what um, I say in the book is that all of these regimes have a kind of democratic Caesarist quality in the sense that those who rule do so in the name of the people and they're Hobbesians in the sense that they insist upon political order. They don't, they don't want an independent active civil society. They don't, do not want investigative journalists causing trouble. They do not want judges who uh, issue rulings against parties or against um, the government of the day. They are all, they all have a Caesarist quality. And I would say, um, as I did um, say in a lecture some months ago in Europe, um, we can 
broadly distinguish electoral populism, you know, the, the, the kind that Vucic is practicing, um, with a state-managed populism, which electoral populism can become. Um, the, the new despotisms, in other words, are institutionalized forms of uh, populism that um, uh, play uh, in accordance with um, the poetry of the people, but institutionalize um, something that uh, actually has very damaging effects on uh, many people. Um, I was, uh, I think the populism discussion is another, is another lecture. Um, uh, my colleague Chantal Mouffe and I spent quite a number of years. I brought her to CSD in London. Uh, we, we spent quite a number of years discussing populism. I, I saw her recently. Um, I said publicly that I think left populism is an oxymor oxymoronic term. Uh, I mean, populism uh, is not a thin ideology. Uh, populism is a style of politics um, uh, conducted in the name of the people. It requires demagogues uh, who are the embodiment of the people. It's a type of politics that does a lot of in-grouping. You know, it creates friends. Um, in the case of number 45, uh, the building of a, uh, of a, of a dynasty. Uh, it also does a lot of outgrouping. Uh, it's in the it's in the spirit to speak in Montesquieu's terms, it's in the spirit of populism that it has to do outgrouping. Um, some people don't belong to the true people. Uh, Muslims, uh, you know, it depends on the context. And populism, as I understand it, is a style of politics that therefore um, has a whiff of violence about it. Uh, it's, not, it's not accidental that number 45 in his 2016 campaign you know, issued um, uh, words about, you know, knock the crap out of them and carry them out, you know, anybody who was giving him a hard time at a rally. And it's not accidental that more recently, you know, he spoke uh, in effect um, about the need for something like martial law uh, inside the United States. And I think finally, all populism, you know, has a love affair with sovereignty, with borders. Um, so it's not a thin ideology, but it's 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 a style of politics that that is a feature of these despotisms. But there are many other things that are going on in these despotisms. That's why um, it, 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 it's not for me um, a replacement uh, category. Um, I wanted to say two last things, if I if I may, uh, gladly to come to Veen and to speak to the Central European University. Um, my old friend Michael Ignatieff, of course, is, um, is now there. Um, the two things I wanted to say was first, uh, just a little comment about um, Georgia and civil society. Um, I mean, in the work that we collectively did in the last 30 years on Civilna uh, Druzhba. I think it was generally um, agreed in research terms that uh, descriptively a civil society is um, a networked plurality of organizations, of actors, um, of many different types. And the normal case is that there are tensions inside uh, a civil society when it is protected by law and protected by government. Um, and there are tendencies for violence to happen. And there are certainly disagreements. Um, I don't think, to, come to the point, I don't think that um, the old 19th century uh, image, for example, associated with Marx and the Second International that a civil society can only be a civil society when there is unity of purpose. That is quite rare. It happened in Poland, um, Solidarność, uh, but it's, it's, it's not the typical case. Um, there are moments 
where different fragments of civil society come together. We've seen something like that in the United States in the last month and a half. You know, Black Lives Matter has drawn together um, social fragments uh, of different people, Jews and Muslims, black and white, Chinese, Indian, and so on, rich and poor, city, um, uh, rural areas, have actually brought together young and old uh, people of different uh, persuasions to pursue um, uh, a basic demand, which is that police violence against black people must stop and there must be justice for black people. Uh, and I, I would say that's um, the typical case. I have just um, written an essay, which is a 40 year history of Zivilna um, Druzhba, the whole idea. And it's one of the ideas that um, the, the, the normal case is one where parts of civil society um, refuse, they, 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 they engage in a kind of mutiny against power and they demand certain things. And when a system is open, when it has democratic qualities, changes uh, follow. Uh, that I think is the normal pattern. May I uh, just end, because I know that um, we are well over time uh, with um, a few remarks to uh, dear Milan about Montesquieu. Uh, I, I, I think I sent you a draft of the book Quite a long time ago, it changed uh, somewhat. Um, but this book is it's something of a love letter to Montesquieu. But it's as happens between lovers. Um, it, the letters contain some quarrels, some disagreements. Um, I thank him in this book for the energy and the intellect of reviving and giving a new significance to the category of despotism that first happens in the lettre persan in the in the persian uh, letters um, and it becomes of course a central category one of three types of polity uh, in the l'esprit des lois in the spirit of the laws um, and i praise him for having change the taxonomy, you know, of, of having made the case for um, privileging the category of despotism, as I do in, in my book. I, I thank him for all of this. But then um, I say that the new despotisms are not defined principally by fear. They are not defined by recklessness. Uh, you know, Montesquieu says in the L'Esprit des Lois, um, you know, the, the natives of Louisiana, when they see uh, fruit in a tree, they chop down the tree. That is despotism. Well, uh, this is not as the new despotisms operate. They are more calculating. Um, they, they have a kind of um, pragmatic quality to them uh, because they know that recklessness at the top you know, fighting among the despots will destroy the system and fighting with the population and doing really stupid things uh, will will uh, endanger the whole polity. So, um, and one final objection, um, although I praise him for uh, those passages where he, he is getting at the problem of voluntary servitude. Um, he's not always consistent about that, but he certainly has it. Although his, uh, that's important, his preoccupation as a constitutional monarch was with the weakness of republics in which, as you said, he includes democracy. And he thinks that ancient republics, you know, the, the democracies of the Greek world uh, can't function under modern conditions, and that the best political form is a self-restraining monarchy where rule of law is important, where there is a plurality of intermediate powers. Uh, he's not a friend of democracy. What I say in this book is that, so he worried that monarchy would degenerate into despotism, and for very good reason. And it became, of course, 
uh, one of the uh, pieces of poetry of the French revolutionaries, that Louis Capet had become a despot, uh, that monarchy was uh, a ruse for, uh, for arbitrary power and had to be defeated, if need be, by, by terror. Um, what I say is that the problem is not the degeneration of monarchy into despotism, but the degeneration of democracy into despotism, as, as uh, you said. And in this sense, I am on the side of Tocqueville uh, rather than, uh, than, than Montesquieu. Uh, but it is thanks to um, Montesquieu, an aristocrat. Um, he was not a bourgeois thinker. He was not a Republican. Uh, he was not um, a blind eyed monarchist. Uh, he was against tyranny. He was against what we would call autocracy. Total power filled him with fear. Uh, but it is thanks to Montesquieu that um, he bequeathed to us this category. And so in this sense, uh, the book is a dialogue uh, with Montesquieu, something of a love letter in which um, some frank, harsh things are said um, with and against him. But I thank you very much for for um, getting me to speak about Montesquieu. Is Montesquieu, Montesquieu, by the way, is Montesquieu translated uh, into Serbian? Yes. Well, um, I, I think it's uh, it's probably time to say um, uh, 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 So, John, uh, you hear me? Yes. Okay, so, I feel so happy. I think this was really a great discussion. I think all of us can be very satisfied. Just to uh, conclude uh, with something what I remember that you told somewhere, you said that Orban and uh, Hungary is the proof that only 10 years is enough. It really is frightening what you, as the fact that uh, 10 years is enough for turning constitutional democracy into new despotism. So I think that we can conclude that your diagnosis, your analysis of particular new despotic regimes, but uh, your analysis even more about new despotism as the global threat uh, for constitutional democracies is the most important one. So struggle against. Yeah. So, so um, you know, if you know very well the Hungarian case, um, you win an election, well, you won a series of elections um, and you corrupt those elections. You tame the judiciary. Um, you make sure that the police um, are on your side. Uh, you, you get rid of um, difficult journalists. Um, you tame the, the civil service bureaucracy. Uh, you camouflage violence. Um, you do outgrouping. You you um, you you speak a lot of uh, a lot of lies and and bullshit, and it only takes you several elections to disarm um, the power sharing rule of law um, and civil society that are you know, conditio sine qua non of democracy. And one of the um, points running through this book is that that dynamic is alive and well in the United States. I mean, almost uh, what I've just said could be described about what number 45 has so far done and what is at stake at the moment. So um, this book is not pessimistic. Uh, it's not a gloomy um, uh, prediction that this everything will end badly, as if you know it's Fukuyama turned upside down. Uh, but what it is is a precautionary tale that warns to look at the dynamics um, for spotting how you lose uh, a power-sharing constitutional democracy. 
and in a way, one last sentence, um, plus ça change, you know, um, with, with friends around the table in Beograd, you know, we have been talking about this and preoccupied with this problem uh, for at least 30 or 35 years. And uh, it's been immensely rich for me. Um, you said, Dragica, very kindly at the beginning that, you know, you learn much from me, but actually learn just as much from you and other colleagues. Um, Dubrovnik, uh, Yugoslavia, and then Milosevic and all that uh, were for me um, intense learning experiences and, of course, very painful um, uh, uh, experiences that shaped my uh, political thinking until today. And it's possibly no accident that, you know, I return to you to speak about despotism <laughs> in a period where, as Milan has just said, um, something like the problem of how to prevent it um, is becoming the central political question of, uh, uh, of your uh, local uh, scene. So I thank you, Palava. And I say <laughs> luck not. Luck not. Thank you so much. Thank you. And see you, see you again soon. I hope so very much. Bravo. Thank you so Bravo. much, John, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. Bravo.